All right, welcome tonight. Um, did everyone get some food and drinks? Um, so we'll get started with a um, few minutes late. Uh, my name is Joseph Boy. I'm the chair for the Consumer Electronic Society for the Santa Clara Valley, and I welcome all of you to come. Um, tonight is uh, interesting. It's instead of a typical uh, tech talk, we actually we have a panel with a uh, combination of uh, investors' perspective and also from the actual hardware startup to talk about the hardware um, startup and innovation systems. Um, so this is the agenda, and um, each of the speakers will give a 15-minute presentation about what they do. And depending if they really can fill up the 15 minutes, maybe we can take a few Q&A uh, at the end of their talk. And then we'll have a uh, panel discussion afterwards. And um, I have a few questions, and I, I think you know, the issue of panel discussion is more interesting when we take questions from the audience. So. Uh, I'll also open up the, uh, the Q&A part uh, to the audience at the 8 o'clock. Um, the little bit of logistics, the bathrooms are uh, out this door to the left, and then I think that's about the only logistics I have. Let me switch to the other slide. So that, um, we have a website that we keep uh, pretty much updated. So all the past, um, after tonight, if the speakers are okay with the presentation, I know one speaker said they cannot actually um, even show slides at public uh, um, events. So they will be posted up in the website, and that's the URL you can find all the previous um, presentations. So if we have young people in our crowd who likes to do Twitch, um, these are the hashtags that we have. Um, this is uh, the roster for this year's officers. So I'm the chair, um, ranking. You might, be, you might be still outside checking in people. He's the vice chair. Um, contact is not able to make it. Um, and then Shamir, I think, is over at the uh, BM World Conference in San Francisco, so he cannot make it. Um, I think bottom row we have uh, um, Eric Kwan Lee, he's also, um, he actually works and lives in San Francisco, so it doesn't come down too often. Um, but if you have any organization you'd like to partner with us uh, for a joint event, um, please get in touch with Eric. And Jeff is also tied up, he's the program chair who will organize a lot of these speakers' events. Vin, Vin was here, or maybe he's still outside helping with the chat. So Vin is uh, one of the program committee members, as well as uh, Krishna. And we're also looking for a membership chair. Um, so every year we run through officer elect uh, elections. So it's going to come up very soon, in um, sometime in uh, I think early part of October, and will be complete by the end of November. So if you're interested to run as officer, volunteers, um, just send me uh, a note um, and what you'd like to do. Um, so. It, the officers are the official officer uh, position that require election to be elected in uh, the chair, vice chair, the uh, secretary, and treasurer. So a lot of the other positions are appointed by the, the chair of the chapter or the, 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 the office committee after, after the fact. And this gave a, a big round of uh, applause for Steve and Neil. I think for this time, um, to be able to use this wonderful facility, they have to stay with us the whole night. And, um, and also, um, um, in preparation of some of the badges, because uh, this is a secret room, that's why they have to check the ID. And the next meeting we already set up, so we have speaker Michael Wang, who used to be uh, one of the officers for the C Society. He's going to be talking about autonomous <coughs> driving and memory system consideration. Um, that's going to be, so our normal meeting for the newcomers um, is always the fourth Tuesday of um, every month, except November and December. So November, because it's uh, Thanksgiving, uh, for, um, Tuesday is Thanksgiving week, so we don't hold any meetings usually on in November. And then December, we move it to the first week, so it's first Tuesday of, um, so you can just check the, uh, the website, or you, you know, and the website actually has a link that you can subscribe to our uh, um, email list. And I think we have, uh, just a quick show of hand, because I think through Eventbrite we kind of know. How many people are IEEE members? 
All right, so we have very high turnout for black community members. And how many are CE members? All right, one third. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this uh, some for, for the information for some of the uh, not people who have not join actually, so we can actually join as a student or as a professional member. Um, and then there's another thing if you just want to try and see how you like it. Um, there's a, something called um, affiliate membership. So affiliate membership has some limitation. You don't get the Spectrum magazine. You cannot run as officers, but then you get basically the same benefit as uh, a member. You know, so you can come to the CME for free. You still get uh, on the email list and everything. And then for membership recruiting, for the people who are already a member, uh, and you help out with um, recruiting other uh, members to join, so you can actually get um, earn credit up to fifteen dollars for professional membership and five dollars for um, e-membership, and that can be applied towards your review for your membership fee for next year. Um, so C Society will publish. Uh, you get two magazines. One is our the Consumer Electronic Magazine, which received an award in two thousand sixteen. Um, and then is the uh, i3 magazine, which is published by the Consumer Electronics. Um, oh, it's actually, I should update that. They now renamed as Consumer Technology Association. Um, if you have any speakers you'd like to bring, um, nominate for you know, future events, um, you, you may send an email to Jeff, who's the program chair, and this is his email address. And if you have a joint event, please email Eric. And here are the upcoming events. And um, eGrid is the um, website, and also they do uh, two emails uh, per month that contains all the actual events in the Bay Area. So it includes San Francisco and Oakland East Bay, as well as Santa Clara Valley. And then Casper actually is the uh, partnering organization. They focus on semiconductor, and we do joint promotion of each other's events. Um, there's a couple of actually how, how we are in it. One is the actually I run the meetup called Silicon Valley Wearable Meetup, um, and then the other one is how how we mess the meetup. Uh, that it, you know, and then the product realization group. So a lot of these meetup groups are um, really focused on you know, consumer electronics hardware products. So I thought um, we'll uh, highlight them to you. And then um, Product Realization Group will have the annual co uh, conference at the uh, museum. I have a little more detailed slide for you. Um, and then October, this in the second, I mean, in this last quarter of the year, there's going to be a whole bunch of annual conferences by different organizations. Um, Casper is going to have theirs on October 13. And then, we'll, actually, we also have a whole human and technology conference in San Jose in October. And then for all the actual e chapter members, um, it is going to be a central area meeting uh, for the officers in October. And um, Brian, you want to come up and say a few words about your conference? Very quickly, hi, uh, I'm Brian Johnson. I chair the uh, Power Electronics Society panels. And I uh, just want to let you guys know that there are some flyers in Bash. We have an event coming up uh, next month on Wednesday the 19th, uh, a very unique one day, uh, full day tutorial. It's called the 5G Energy Efficiency Tutorial. And um, essentially, you know, there's lots of 5G related events. Um, this isn't about market projections. This isn't about channel modeling. Um, this is about a real issue today that, 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 that the only projections um, are broken the way they are today because there simply isn't enough power in the world to power the, you know, billions or trillions of devices based on the standard we have today. So this is all about is a, a excellent lineup of top-notch speakers from all aspects of the network. Um, from edge stuff, everything. So whether you're involved in 5G or power or not, um, if you're involved in IoT wearables, um, autonomous vehicles, you know, AR, I, uh, VR, uh, pretty much anything that will touch the 5G network, um, that this this content is highly applicable to you, and I promise you it will be uh, a very eye-opening and uh, very uh, educational, worthwhile event. So if you're interested, uh, you register now, find flyer back, and come talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the um, uh, the one uh, put up uh, earlier, uh, you have something there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me finish this here now for you. Um, is the um, annual conference for the uh, product realization groups? They are uh, going to be holding it at the Computer History Museum. So you have a few more days to go to sign up for the 15% discount. Um, so they will have about uh, 15 hardware demos and 300 people on uh, related in the hardware ecosystem there. And then the 
next thing is the uh, Global Humanitarian Technology Conference. So if your company has actually, um, well, because uh, a lot of companies like NVIDIA, Intel, uh, Qualcomm, um, you all have some kind of co uh, corporate social responsibility and uh, they project to, uh, they want to join this um, conference to highlight uh, some of the contribution that you have made towards uh, using technology to uh, uh, resolve some of the humanitarian challenges in the world. And that's going to be in San Jose in uh, October um, 18 to the 21st. And here are some of the previous um, uh, company who was sponsored and excited to talk. And Fred, you have something too, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Fred Stein. I'm with an organization called B-Lab, B-L-A-B dot O-R-G. And we're putting up an event that would be a good follow-up to this. It's about the use of RISC-V and how this is going to enable a whole new generation of, of chip vendors. And in fact, the, the uh, S-5 organization will be on our panel. So these events are held at uh, Stanford in the faculty club. Um, they're $35 right now. The price will go up in, in, a, in, a, in a short while. And uh, we, will, we will send all you guys uh, um, a discount code. You know, so you'll be able to get $10 off the, the price. Um, so again, Stanford Faculty Club, BLAB.org, risk five. Thank you very much. And I got a few flyers. If anyone wants to grab one. So if any company is hiring and you want to make a quick announcement, you can raise your hand and I can pass you the mic. No? No risk hiring? Um, got all the engineers you want, huh? All right. Next is, uh, if you're seeking full-time employment or part-time employment, anybody wants to give um, one minute? So everybody is happy to work with you. Oh, here. So I'm the first one. All right. The side five. The side is always hired. Okay. <laughs> so you want to say yes? So, hi, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm on the panel uh, from Sci-5 for the, for the RISC-5 guys. You'll pretty much learn what we're doing after I talk. Uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, we're hiring all sorts of folks. We really want people who know both software and hardware. Uh, it's about using software to write hardware. So, uh, new design techniques, everything. Um, there's, a, there's a fit for, for everybody. Thank you. So, Next up, um, yeah, well, you have something to say about why you're not professional? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Fabo. Uh, I'm the chair for uh, IC, IEEE Santa Clara Valley Young Professionals. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program of uh, IEEE Startup and Innovation Symposium. Um, this event is organized by IEEE SCV Consumer Electronics Society, Young Professionals, and the uh, Solid State Service Society. Um, so if you enjoyed today's program, please check out our other events by uh, visiting our website. And uh, we have events on a monthly basis. So we organized this event with the uh, observation that the past year saw tremendous growth in the uh, hardware startup arena. So I think this is a truly amazing time to be doing hardware. Perhaps the uh, biggest drivers for the recent hardware development are artificial intelligence enabled ASICs, as well as the uh, new architecture RISC V. And we're fortunate here tonight to have startups in uh, both fields to be with us tonight. Um, so the first half of tonight's program is a series of lightning presentations. Um, then the theme of the event is uh, innovation and startup. We invited two well-known chip startups, Critical and sci 5 to share their journey of entrepreneurship. We are also fortunate to have two VC speakers from UFIRST Capital and SK Hynix who will be talking about the recent trends in hardware innovation from a VC perspective. The second half of tonight's program is a panel discussion moderated by uh, Joseph Wei. Um, Joseph is a partner at Sky Tree Ventures and has experience managing multiple incubators and venture labs. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Ryan Cousins. He's the founder and the CEO of Critical. Ryan is an alumnus of UCLA, where he obtained a BS in mechanical engineering. He's worked in the health tech industry, where he cuts his teeth researching and innovating new products in the biomedical field. His R&D experience led him to the 
to developing better systems for medical device, consumer electronics, and mechatronics. He found it critical for his two founding members to share, and they share a vision for solving complex problems engineers face around integrating microprocessors in IoT systems. Their first platform, Snickerdoodle, um, is a prototype production platform for empowering robotics, drones, computer vision, and beyond. So without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Mr. Ryan Cadet. Uh, but 
things that you might necessarily think about uh, during the course of uh, building a product and what kind of goes into it to get it actually in customers' hands. Um, so anyway, you can check that out if you want. Um, 2016, we got our first hardware, uh, went into production in 2016, 2017. Uh, and part of our whole uh, business model is based on other people designing our product into their product. Um, so we got our first OEM application in 2017. Uh, in 2018, we've been busy scaling, getting into distribution, uh, building out the product line, all that kind of stuff. And going forward, um, we're getting more into kind of end, end system development, um, more kind of AI-focused hardware uh, to, you know, do even more energy efficient um, algorithm acceleration for these kind of higher end applications. Um, when you're developing the kind of systems that we're typically dealing with, uh, the, arguably the three biggest pain points are power consumption, performance, and integration. Um, so, like we just mentioned a couple minutes ago, uh, this upcoming event, um, of the 5G event, uh, power is a huge uh, a huge factor in all these edge devices, and not only edge, but even the transmission of the data across the network. Um, so you want to lighten your, your bandwidth, the amount of data you're sending over the network as much as possible without losing a bunch of data in the process. Um, and while you're doing that, performance at the edge is becoming more and more important as more people are looking to elevate the amount of computation and the capabilities of these end devices. Um, and integrating these systems, especially when it comes to mechatronics, uh, where you're tying together, you know, not only just actuators and motors and things of that nature, but, you know, sensors and cameras and microphones and all these different things. Um, what you run into a lot of the times is integration problem uh, with these traditional architectures that are very fixed once you get them out of the box. Um, so you eventually run out of a lot of I.O. And, and, and flexibility and capabilities. Um, to tie all those pieces together into one coherent system without making a gigantic mess of all the software. Um, so what we did is took that whole problem and solved it with this thing uh, called Snickerdoodle. Uh, it's kind of hard to appreciate the size of it because this is blown up, you know, 40x. But it's, uh, it's the size of a business card. Um, and it's, like I mentioned before, it's got a, an ARM and FPGA uh, SOC on board, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, memory, a supervisory microcontroller, and a bunch of I.O. Um, so there's uh, 180 reconfigurable I.O. Uh, on there, um, in addition to a bunch of grounds and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's really kind of targeted towards um, you know, a combination of, of mechatronic and high bandwidth applications. Um, but what we've seen with you know, using an FPGA-based solution as opposed to a traditional you know, GPU or, or uh, microprocessor microcontroller um, is you get significant uh, performance improvements in terms of compute per watt. Um, so basically, the, the amount of horsepower you're getting versus compared to the amount of energy it's consuming. Um, the acceleration of these different algorithms, if you can take a, basically a completely software-based approach and reconfigure that to run on dedicated hardware without going through the effort of spending you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on running your own ASIC, um, you can get you know five to two hundred x sometimes more acceleration um, on you know things like computer vision, you know, mechatronic control, things like that. Um, the I/O flexibility is a big element, uh, like I was saying, when you're actually developing the system. Um, but the reconfigurability is really interesting because we're in such a rapidly evolving environment um, with you know all the AI, machine learning, all these these cool things people come up with every day. Um, having flexible enough hardware for you to optimize that even after your product shift um, or during the, the life cycle of the product is a huge advantage, um, you know, both competitive uh, and technology. So, um, like I mentioned, the, the two kind of core categories the systems fall into, I'll get into a couple of brief use cases in a second, but um, are generally speaking mechatronics, so big automated systems, industrial automation, even medical devices, uh, you know, robot, uh, mobile, mobile systems, um, or high bandwidth stuff uh, like computer vision, networking, communications, those types of things. Um, one example of a product that we uh, helped commercialize um, that was based on Snickerdoodle uh, is this company in Australia um, built this uh, video uh, networking box, uh, where basically they're just bolting this thing to the side of the camera in a broadcast uh, type environment, like a studio, um, and uh, doing the real-time uh, video encoding to take those signals and 
um, send those out over an IP network. Uh, and what they used to be solving this with is some gigantic, you know, desktop thing that sits on the floor, costs ten thousand um, dollars, because they're running a traditional x86 architecture, and there's, there wasn't they used to have, to have so much horsepower uh, behind it to actually get the kind of throughput that they needed. Um, they wanted it to be portable enough where you could literally just bolt it inside the camera and walk around, you know, the studio with it. Um, so that's uh, that was sort of an, in, an implementation where you're taking a software-based approach turning it into basically a hardware-based approach without doing a full-blown um, custom chip run, uh, and then turn, making that embedded and turn it out, you know, thousand of them a month or whatever it is. Um, another, on the mechatronic side of things, uh, this is kind of not the greatest picture in the world, but um, this is a multi-axis, uh, a multi-axis uh, motor control system that we built for a Chinese motor manufacturer. Um, where they basically wanted to take uh, a single hardware platform and control uh, six axes, uh, Brussels DC axes at the same time, um, and then run, because it's got the ARM, uh, the ARM core is on the SOC, uh, run the path planning and Linux and all the networking higher end stuff um, on the ARM core. So you're doing the real time single processing, motor control, and the FPGA. And the you know running ROS and Linux and all this other nonsense on the uh, on the ARM side of things. So um, this is kind of a cool one chip solution where you know as opposed to some of these alternative methods that you might end up with like seven different processors on a board and then you have to network them all together. You have performance degradation and all sorts of other problems. Uh, another part of what we do, uh, kind of getting toward the end here, but uh, what another part of what we do is uh, engineering services. So um, to kind of both not only keep the lights on, you know, with a cash strap startup, but also to have some long-term benefit of helping people actually design our products into systems. Um, we, you know, do hardware, software, and, and system development uh, for companies who are looking to build systems like these um, video conversion boxes, you know, mechatronic controls, computer vision, all types of things. Um, we basically do perform that service to help people, like I say, integrate our product into their devices. Um, you know, this is what, one of the things that we're always looking for. We're because we're such a horizontal, uh, a horizontal uh, company um, in terms of the markets that we touch. Uh, because the system, the, the kind of fundamental product that we develop, uh, is so generic. Um, it's, it's kind of a tight spot to fit it in because you don't want to be so generic that it's not useful, but you also want it to be uh, flexible enough for a bunch of different people to be able to use it. Um, so. By extension, we exposed a lot of different industries. Um, so we're always looking for different, you know, new advisors uh, who have specific knowledge in, in individual verticals um, that we can work with. Uh, investors, of course, who are in the early stages of a new funding round. Um, new systems and projects for people to work on and work with, uh, as well as partnerships. Um, you know, IBM, Xilinx, and Arm, and a few of these other guys that we're already partners with. Uh, we're also looking to get into education as well. Because um, our platform has got, uh, you know, kind of ideal for that. Um, and like contact info is like somewhere. Oh, this is kind of crazy. Uh, no, yeah, all right. This is pretty wild. Uh, yeah. So, so my contact information is in the corner there. So, uh, cousinsinquiry.com. If anyone's got any questions, um, I think we might have a couple minutes for questions. I'll be on the panel later. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know. And I'm willing to sit and hang around and talk to people about, uh, you know, if they have specific questions about um, startups, what it takes, you know, advice, criticisms, uh, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm uh, open to discuss anything with anybody who's got any, any questions. So, anyway, thanks. So we would interface with them um, on the back end. So we're, we are at the edge. Um, pretty much, I mean, we've looked at down the line getting into uh, something that's kind of one step closer to being on the back end um, with more kind of like the high power uh, AI the hardware. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, these are all, all this stuff's implemented in devices. 
Um, so most of the people using our products are you know OEMs and device manufacturers. Um, so you know if we're in a lot of those instances, people will use our use our hardware to parse the information coming in um, and get it in a, into a consumable or par, par, you know pared down form that then you can send out over the network to a back end and then do whatever you're going to do in the cloud type thing. Well, connectivity in terms of you can you can send the data, data over the network, um, but or you know mesh networking and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the problem is with a lot of like real time systems, cloud processing isn't really useful for you. Um, I mean, you you want to say if you're running a connected factory, there's a certain element of that where you want to harvest all that data, so you can do predictive analytics and maintenance and all the rest of that stuff. Um, but something's got to run the robots, you know. So, uh, well, probably, like, I mean, you can't send, you can't have motor control happening, you know, over a two thousand mile long wire kind of thing. So, um, when you're talking about, you know, microsecond loops and stuff like that, so those are, you know, a lot of our systems are safety critical, mission critical type stuff. Um, but you know, and at the same time, the the other issue with just if you have, like, I say, a, a, another example that isn't necessarily a hardcore mechatronics application, um, but if you have like a security and surveillance system, um, it's not really practical to just stream, you know, like 18, you know, full HD cameras over your your broadband to uh, some AWS farm in, in Nevada or whatever. Um, it's it's just going to cost you so much money, and it's like just unnecessary use of power. If you can offload as much of that processing to the edge as possible, um, you can have huge, huge cost savings and huge performance improvements uh, in the long run. So that's that's kind of that's the piece that we're taking off. We're taking all of that load off of those uh, a lot a lot of the uh, data processing on the back end. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's it just depends on what you're doing. I mean if you're uh, there's. There are certain you know power and performance envelopes that specific applications have to fit into. It, of course, like there's a million different you know uh, applications out there. But yeah, I mean it's, it really just kind of depends on you know there's no point shoehorning you know extra horsepower into something that you don't need. Um, but you know you need real time performance, kind of higher performance stuff, a lot of parallel processing, you know more intensive uh, facial recognition or object detection, or you need to integrate that with the system or all these different things. Um, there's some severe limitations to just like sticking some three dollar microcontroller on there and just hoping that you know, just waiting for the data to come back. You know, there's definitely a, a broad range of, of applications for all this stuff. Yeah, good question. I think that's all the time we have. Oh. Um, so we can please save your questions for the panel discussion. That's a nice, Mr. Ryan Helen. So uh, now that we heard, we heard from the uh, AI startup side, we'd like to switch gears and uh, listen to a lightning presentation on the uh, venture side. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Josh Su. Josh is a uh, senior manager at SK Hynix Venture, which is the uh, venture arm of uh, SK Hynix, a global semiconductor supplier, HQs in Korea. Josh is an engineer by training and has been working at both startups and big corporations in uh, R&D, product development, and operations before switching career focus to business and venture investment. Josh has worked for both financial and corporate VCs with investment focused on, with investment focused on around enabling technologies in AI, data center infrastructure, and sensory systems. Josh graduated from National Taiwan University and had an MS from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and an MBA from Kellogg School of Management. Please join me in welcome Josh Su. session and uh, I think I'll be quick to save more time for our panel discussion. Uh, well, first, apologize, there's no slide. Uh, if you work in a, a memory chip company in Korea, you know how hard it is to send any material out or share anything public. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'll try my best to uh, walk you through to the next, uh, for the next 15 minutes uh, about what we do, uh, who we are, what we do, and uh, share a little bit uh, of uh, what we see in the uh, startup environment in the semiconductor industry. So, uh, 
Uh, I assume that you know some of you might not be very aware of uh, what uh, SK Hynix or SK Group is about. Uh, SK Hynix is one of uh, I think 95 subsidiaries of uh, SK Group, which is uh, one of the largest conglomerates in Korea. Uh, the business range from energy, petrochemical, uh, telecommunication, technology, and semiconductor. Uh, SK Hynix is sitting at the semiconductor side. We are a global memory chip supplier. Uh, outside of uh, DRAM, uh, NAND flash SSDs, we also manufacture CMOS memory sensors. Uh, thanks to the skyrocketing uh, memory price, uh, our revenue last year is uh, $30 billion, uh, which places us uh, number three in terms of a global semiconductor company, uh, right after uh, Samsung and, uh, and Intel. So in terms of uh, uh, SK Hynix Ventures, uh, we are quite early in the venture investment theme in the, uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, we started the team in 2015 and made our first investment in 2016. Uh, we, are, we are still actively ramping up our uh, venture investment practice. Uh, you know, our goal is to deploy 25 to $30 million this year uh, with target of uh, six direct investments. Uh, I think so far we are well, well uh, on track to the goal and maybe even exceed uh, number of six, uh, target number of six uh, scarves. Uh, that will talk about that later. And uh, so, uh, so we are a corporate investor, right? So, as a strategic investors, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't care about financial uh, performance, but uh, we also hold responsibility of uh, bring back strategic value back to the company. So, uh, we work closely with uh, our business unit and the headquarters uh, and R&D department as well. So we try to align with business objective as well as the longer, you know, the bigger uh, corporate strategy. So we don't require direct or immediate uh, business collaboration with our portfolio company or our you know, potential investments, but we help to facilitate the you know, business discussion in parallel to our investment discussion. Um, uh, so uh, you know, as a corporate VC, uh, that means our investment uh, ultimately need to be signed up by our CEO and CFO. So, uh, you know, in terms of investment process, uh, you know, we work uh, with uh, business leaders in each of the business units and the R&D department to form the investment committees and to discuss and you know, ultimately decide whether we go forward uh, with the investment or not. Uh, so next, uh, I'm going to talk about our uh, venture investment practice. So, uh, we, our focus, uh, you know, uh, I will open that between the two uh, categories. First is direct investment into stocks, and the second one is indirect investment into VC funds. Uh, and I'll talk more about each in detail. So uh, for the first one, it's pretty clear, right? So we look at uh, uh, the stocks that's uh, closely related to our core business in memory technology and CMOS new sensors. We also look into stocks that's uh, uh, around adjacent emerging markets. So, for example, in data center infrastructure, in the sensory systems, especially on the cars today, uh, in AI and IoT. But we look for enabling technologies, meaning that we don't uh, so much uh, uh, engage with startups at the application uh, level, uh, but more you know, uh, uh, technology or IPs with uh, some strong tie to the physical layer or the hardware. Right? So that's uh, kind of a related to our Companies a long term uh, go as well. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, venture investment practice, uh, we are stage agnostic, but uh, the sweet spot for us would be uh, Series A, B, and C runs, uh, where uh, we feel comfortable. You know, typically, a company at that stage is past proof of concept or has uh, some initial customer discussion. Um, our check size is $1 to $5 million, typically, it depends on the stage. And uh, we usually set a rotation of uh, 12 weeks from start of due diligence to uh, wire the money to your bank. So we spend about six weeks uh, to do uh, product, financial, legal due diligence, and uh, three to four weeks for that internal uh, headquarter approval process. And uh, additional three weeks uh, just to go through the government documentation to wire the money out from Korea. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the region that we cover, uh, the team here, uh, we are a small team of six people, uh, all based in Silicon Valley. We cover globally except for two countries. Uh, we don't invest in Korea, where our headquarters is based. We don't invest in China, 
uh, which is uh, you know, a country really hard to invest if you are not there. So we have a sister team that's uh, based in Shanghai, China, that looks at the uh, uh, startup ecosystem in China. Um, and then uh, in terms of indirect investment, so we also play the uh, LP role and a limited partner role invest into uh, the VC funds. Uh, but we don't so much you know, invest into the general VC, you know, the big uh, general VC funds, but uh, we focus on the VC fund that help us to increase or expand their, uh, their coverage in terms of the vertical industry. Uh, for example, we, uh, we, we invest into uh, the auto tech ventures that just you know, look at the mobility and the car automotive industry. And uh, another reason, uh, another uh, goal is to help us to expand our coverage uh, geographically. Uh, so for example, we are in uh, IMEC, IMEC's uh, X fund that help us to cover you know, not only the semiconductor, but also you know, in general European region. Um, so another goal for us is just to, you know, uh, for geo sourcing purpose, right? So uh, we got the referral from our VC funds, uh, you know, partners from VC funds uh, for co-investment opportunities, and some of the startups that they met might not fall into their uh, investment scope, but uh, might relate it direct to uh, SK Hynix, and we will you know, talk to them and take a look at it. Uh, and the last goal for us is just to build a network, right? So as I mentioned, we are fairly new into the investment theme, and uh, you know, into uh, we, we want to leverage a network, you know, with uh, our VC fund partners, and uh, you know, build our own network in the long run. Uh, lastly, I want to share a little bit about uh, uh, what we see in the uh, uh, startup thing, uh, startup investment uh, in the semiconductor industry. Uh, so the three uh, points I want to cover. So I think we'll probably will touch upon that uh, during our panel discussion. So the first one is AI, right? So uh, we're sitting, we're already in the Nvidia building today, and uh, you know, it's it's really hard to not walk into a startup pitch and uh, they don't talk about AI or machine learning these days. Uh, I don't, well, it's, I don't know if it's good or bad, or I don't know whether it's a bubble when it burst, but uh, it definitely you know uh, helped it. it uh, has a, brings a great impact to the same kind of industry, right? So uh, people realize that you know, to achieve what AI claims that they can do today, uh, they really need a fundamental uh, uh, you know, relook at the hardware level, right? They really need a, a new uh, jumping uh, innovation in the hardware. So that's why we see a lot of uh, AI-related hardware chip companies, right? I think up to three years ago, uh, when I was with, with, with uh, Intel Capital, it's really hard. Well, it's not easy to find a semiconductor chip star. But uh, I think since uh, one, two years ago, they're just uh, very many. Right? So, uh, and we're definitely going to see a lot of innovation coming out from this space. And I'm excited. The second one is a uh, uh, car. Right? So uh, automotive segment is the fastest growing uh, segment in the uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, especially, you know, when, you know, as memory uh, vendor, how we look at. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are. I think we met uh, 30 plus lidar company. We met 20 plus radar companies, uh, startups, right? So, uh, it just, you know, we see uh, people look at the car as a new uh, platform for compute, for storage, for new sensors. So uh, that would drive a lot of innovation and a lot of uh, capital into this space. So. Uh, that's another area that uh, we see a lot of innovations that, you know, so that, you know, ultimately, right, people still want to have a Thomas car in the world, right? And then to achieve that, there's so much uh, innovation that needs to happen uh, before, you know, we have a, you know, a Thomas car in the world. And uh, the last one is uh, China. So I just saw a catching headline today that uh, the AI, uh, the money pouring to the AI investment in China is uh, $5 billion last year and uh, exceed uh, you know, AI investment in U.S. last year, which is about $4.7 billion. So I don't know how, how accurate is the number, but that definitely indicates uh, you know, uh, the bigger trend is happening uh, in China. And uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get into why or the reason, right? so there's a political reason, or you know, uh, definitely Chinese government's influence uh, is uh, significant to uh, you know, um, Kind of uh, revive or uh, stimulate uh, to support their domestic uh, chip and semiconductor company, 
but uh, we are definitely going to see, you know, especially with the market in China, uh, domestic market by China itself, uh, we're going to see significant innovation from China as well, right? So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting space uh, uh, to investment as well as start today in the semiconductor industry. Uh, I'll be happy to chat more after the panel discussion or during, during our panel, uh, but, you know, uh, thank you. I think for the interest of time, we'll uh, ask you to keep your questions to the end of the Thank you, Josh. So uh, I'd like to uh, keep some momentum and uh, introduce our next EC speaker, which is uh, Dr. Ita Kang. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Deng is the CEO and founder of UFIRST Capital, which is the first structured platform to bring together top universities, corporations, and VCs globally for innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, Dr. Deng is a seasoned industry executive with 15 years of experience in product, business development, and venture capital. She brings a standard network from the uh, venture capital and corporate board to startups, such as the uh, innovation and investment arms of Honda, Yamaha, NTT, NTT, SAP, Google, Samsung, Intel, just to name a few. Dr. Deng has also been a member of uh, Hillary Clinton's Technology Policy Advisory Committee. She has a uh, PhD in physics and is a graduate of UC Berkeley High School Venture Capital Program. Let's welcome Dr. Deng. Thank you, Info, and uh, thank you, everybody, for giving me an opportunity to present what You First Capital is all about. Um, like Renvo mentioned, I've been in the corporate world for about 15-ish years. Um, started off from a product uh, product strategy perspective, and uh, then gravitated over to the business side of things and looked at the industry from a venture. Uh, side of things, mainly focused around IoT and cybersecurity, but in the course of taking different roles across my corporate career, I've been fortunate enough to be faced with problems which gave me the idea of creating this platform called You First Capital. So You First Capital is an innovation hub, uh, as it mentions, that brings universities, corporations, and VCs together. So in my corporate career, I've come across problems where uh, I was looking for, uh, as an example, a facial recognition technology like seven years ago. And at that time, it was hard to Google up those kind of startups and be able to come up with a list. If I Google such um, you know, uh, facial recognition companies today, I'm sure I can count at least 30. And uh, like Josh mentioned, China is at the forefront of some major uh, giant gorillas and unicorns in the facial recognition space today, and for good reasons. So, um, like I mentioned, you first capital is positioned right where this cross sits. There are a lot of innovation hubs, accelerators, uh, incubators uh, in the Bay Area outside as well that are high, heavily focused around startups corporations and VCs. The idea is to be able to marry academia, the wealth of knowledge and innovation coming from academia and really position you first capital right where this cross sits. Uh, <clears throat> we have a global reach now and we've been fortunate enough to harness um, our years of uh, you know, relationships, networks, working across different, uh, experts across different geographies. So we have advisors now in Brazil, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Indonesia, India, and China. Um, like I mentioned, the whole idea behind the platform is to be able to act as an external innovation arm for corporations. And being part of a big corporate, I know that there are really good reasons why corporations 
are uh, interested and uh, find this kind of a platform useful, particularly for scouting some unique technologies and being able to establish mini consortia outside of their uh, giant umbrella and be able to harness the power of the network coming from academia, from the startup community, and co-investors around them. So we are raising a small uh, venture fund, about $20 million. We have one big uh, corporation, about $60 million in revenue, that is already um, an LP, and uh, we are not allowed to speak about them publicly yet, but soon we'll be doing a joint announcement with them. This particular company is a U.S. corporation which is very interested in innovation around smart materials and robotics as it applies to healthcare and smart cities in general. Uh, but definitely we are open to having other um, investors, LPs, uh, you know, uh, with regard to this fund. So I won't go into the fund details, but we are opening up this platform for a corporate sponsorship model uh, at a 200K uh, per year, we'll be giving access to the top startups in the area of interest of the corporate. Um, get you know, give access to the advisors, and I'll get to the list of advisors of you first capital. Um, quarterly events, innovation happen, events will happen under this umbrella. Uh, we'll be providing branding at the U first capital's annual innovation summit and access to university talent as well as expertise in academia. So this is really not. Um, not an accelerator where we will have like a mass demo of startups all the way ranging from alternate protein sources to cloud infrastructure. This is really like a boutique innovation hub targeted towards the specific deep domain knowledge, expertise, and innovation that a particular big corporate is looking for um, in, in terms of uh, this platform being an external innovation hub for them. Um, from a university standpoint, um, this, with this particular idea of an external innovation arm is resonating very well. Um, universities are great teaching and research institutes, and some top universities have siloed deep pockets of innovation as well. The idea is to be able to come up as an unbiased platform first as a, that will act as a mode of discovery to start with, but at the same time be able to um, demonstrate the play of um, the ecosystem and uh, you know, utilize that ecosystem for creating innovation in different uh, domains. So um, University of California is a big anchor partner with us. We have a contract signed with UC Santa Cruz where they've allocated their brand new building actually off of uh, Bowers and Scott, so uh, probably two stoplights away from here. Um, and uh, they will be, you know, this building is available for activities for this innovation hub, but also University of California has provided this building space to host an accelerator, which will uh, help about 25 startups that will be physically located here. Um, for, um, you know, they'll be, they're providing an office space for a year for those startups, as well as um, actually sponsoring um, innovation activities and um, help coming from this ecosystem and acceleration services provided by you first capital for all startups that have a UC affiliation. So all founders who have um, a, a student or a faculty or a researcher or anybody who has been a UC alum, University of California is very aligned to sponsoring um, their, their presence, office presence in this building, along with acceleration services that will be coming through this innovation hub for those startups. So these are all the universities that are partners with us today, and uh, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have advisors from UC Princeton, uh, UCSD, UCSC, uh, Harvard, Babson, University of Pennsylvania, Northwestern Kellogg, um, Cornell, Singularity, some presence outside as well, Tsinghua University, uh, University of Melbourne, Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies, and so on. <coughs> so this is our industry ecosystem. Again, we have advisors across multiple innovation arms um, in this ecosystem, 
And uh, you know, for some of the corporations, we have their venture arm very interested and connected with us. And uh, we have identified advisors who will come at a regular cadence to this innovation hub and talk about their gaps in innovation so the startups can start aligning their uh, products uh, towards fulfilling those gaps in innovation. That's their goal. Um, and uh, in that capacity, uh, you know, Microsoft, Cisco, Honda, Fosun, which is a big Chinese conglom conglomerate actually with presence in multiple domains including healthcare, fintech, etc. Um, NBC Universal from a media, media perspective, Global Logic, which is actually an IT solutions provider to all the major retailers you can think of, um, apparel brands in North America, um, JD.com, everyone is familiar with this big e-commerce player in Asia, SAP, uh, Samsung, Cyberport is again a Hong Kong based conglomerate. Cybernaut is a private equity fund in China again that has strategically acquired like uh, 10 to 15 angel investment funds under its wing. So they are a partner with us as well. And then Entity, uh, which is a big Japanese, one of the three top Japanese health codes, and uh, MetLife. Google Kazana is actually a Malaysian government sovereign fund. Again, very interested in having um, a piece of innovation, particularly in AI, machine learning, and cybersecurity uh, in North, from North America. So um, we have we we have uh, been fortunate enough to utilize and uh, harness the feedback and constant inputs coming from these people. Melissa Mayer has been a good friend. She looks at this platform as also a unique channel of innovation coming um, from this ecosystem that uniquely has these schools, the startups, as well as the corporations um, together. And then Dheeraj, who's, um, who's, on, who's the CEO of Mutanix, which is a very well-known company in the Bay Area. He's been uh, the founder of the company and is now the CEO of the public company in the converged infrastructure space. Um, Mark is on the board of Stanford Medical Facility and is a serial entrepreneur and investor himself. And Dan is the president of the Malaysian Government Innovation Now. So we've been um, getting good feedback from our friends with regard to this platform. Uh, on the industry advisory board, we have people like Scott McNeely, who's the founder of Sun Microsystems, uh, Sudhir, who has been the ex CTO of Liberty Global, a chief product officer of Entity, ex CIO of Tesla, and senior execs um, from SAP, Google, um, Yamaha Motor Ventures, and uh, we've built an university advisory board as well. I grew up actually reading papers of. Uh, uh, Dr. Krishna from Stanford, and uh, that time I used to be in awe or in terms of the work he had done, and I'm now fortunate enough to and feel blessed that he's on our advisory board. So that's on the semiconductor side, but we have a pretty wide experience, I think, uh, domain experience covered through our university advisory board, uh, where we have either people who are um, in the associate you know, vice chancellor positions, very tied to the commercialization innovation arms um, of their own um, campuses and, and their own schools, or people who are top domain experts in a particular domain like computer vision. So um, this is our presence in Brazil. Some of these corporations, you know, are uh, Fortune 500 corporations like Baird and Government Innovation Arms as well that are partners with us today. Um, these are our partners from an Indonesia perspective as well. CD Corp is a big retail conglomerate which has about 200 stores in Indonesia and several fintech and entertainment assets. Startup Surabaya is a government innovation arm in, in Indonesia and Kyber is a Telco veteran run very Google uh, aligned accelerator in Indonesia. So then we have more partners, I won't go into all the details here, uh, across China, Hong Kong, and these are the sectors we are looking at uh, with regard to this external innovation. Uh, keeping it broad, uh, particularly because 
there is a lot of um, intersection of these two sectors today. Uh, as we look at companies, they are positioned um, you know, across multiple sectors um, and are touching on several applications as well. Um, friends of the firm have uh, been networking very heavily in the venture community, so have uh, you know, advisors across the top venture funds as well, and they look at it as a unique platform because um, I think it's, it is the first structured platform in terms of bringing innovation from the university ecosystem and uh, being a single point of discovery across multiple universities and schools along with bringing the usual corporations and, and the startup ecosystem along. Uh, we'll be offering some courses as well, and some of these would be deep domain uh, courses, like uh, courses on AI, big data, robotics, etc., taught by the top 10 um, domain experts in North America in these particular um, domains or proprietary courses like the Google Design Sprint course, and I've been a mentor at Google Launchpad for about two and a half, three years. So those kind of proprietary courses are open up only to people who are either Google employees or have been mentors to their innovation programs. And I'm happy to extend the umbrella out to this external innovation arm to this platform. Thank you. Again, we'll keep our questions toward the uh, panel. Um, Dr. Tang touched upon a few uh, interesting sectors, such as uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, and autonomous vehicles. Um, one of the key enabling technologies for these applications is uh, new hardware architecture that can enable all these uh, new technology. And uh, Sci5 is a, uh, is a uh, semiconductor startup company that's making a new risc <coughs> chip that uh, will become the next disruptor. Um, so I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Jack, Jack Kang. Jack is currently the Vice President at Sci5. Um, Sci5 builds off the most advanced risk cores in the world and delivers the, inter the industry's first open source hardware platform. So uh, prior to joining Sci5, Jack held a variety of senior business development, product management, and marketing roles at both NVIDIA and Marvell, with a strong track record of very successful large-scale design wins. Jack started his career as a front-end design engineer with a focus on CPU architecture and design. Jack received his BS degree in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. Now, let's welcome Mr. Jack Ken. All right, thank you. Um, so, before I begin, I guess I should ask, how many people know RISC-V? All right, that's pretty good. Um, we're definitely uh, almost at 100%, not quite there yet. Um, so Sci-5 was founded by the inventors of RISC-V. Um, so uh, many of you don't know, just to clarify, make sure we're all on the same page here, uh, RISC-V at its core, uh, it's free, it's open, what is it? Uh, RISC-V is really just the instruction set architecture. So the set of instructions, uh, the specification, if you will, of how to build a CPU, uh, that is at the heart of what RISC-V is, and that is the part that's free and open, and anybody can use it, and anybody can implement it, and anybody can build whatever they want with it. Um, so with that comes a couple of very interesting uh, things that you can do. Uh, so for example, you can build your own RISC-V core. You can be a CPU designer, you can design your own RISC-V CPU, keep it secret, never share with anybody, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, you can build it, you can tell everybody you're building this, uh, but only use it for yourself, that's also okay. Um, or, you know, more traditionally, you can build it, you can license it, you can sell it to somebody else, that's also allowed. Um, and because you can do whatever you want, you can license it under whatever commercial terms you want, it means you can also license it under an open source license. So this is where uh, a lot of people uh, get confused about RISC-V is because there happens to be a few RISC-V implementations that are available in open source. Uh, so those are uh, free and open implementations under whatever open source license uh, that they were released under. So the company, Sci-Fi got its start uh, in Berkeley. So RISC-V was a, uh, originally designed to be a three-month project. Uh, it was a three-month research project. Uh, at the time, um, at Berkeley, graduate students at Berkeley actually tape out uh, a lot of chips, and then they needed a CPU uh, to do some of their research projects. Um, in order to do so, uh, they looked at all the architectures 
uh, that were available to them, um, you know, ARM, x86, commercial, uh, and for a variety of reasons, both complexity, uh, commercial, the uh, fact that they needed 64 bit, uh, it was decided that the easiest way uh, to actually get going was to create in their own ISA for research purposes. So that's why it's a three month project to create a very simple um, CPU for research purposes. Um, and I'm cutting out a lot of parts of the story in the interest of time, uh, but the reason why it's called RISC V uh, is actually the fifth generation of RISC processors that came out of UC Berkeley, starting with RISC I uh, in the 70s by Dave Patterson. Uh, so there was a RISC I, a RISC II, um, and then RISC III and RISC IV were called something else, um, and Dave always regretted not calling it RISC III and RISC IV, so when they went back and they built this, uh, that's why it's RISC V, uh, so it's a Roman numeral V, uh, not RISC V. So, uh, as a research project, they started RISC-V. Uh, they were building multiple cores, so you can actually see here. Uh, anyway, uh, at Berkeley, they taped out a bunch of different chips with RISC-V cores in them, uh, about a dozen uh, or so different chips. Uh, and pretty soon, as this was happening, uh, they started incorporating it into coursework, and people started asking um, questions about this. They questions from random folks, like, hey, why did you change this, or why did you modify that? Um, they weren't really actually changing anything. These were just like instruction sets and homework assignments uh, for students to be like, what would happen if something like this changed? Um, so because we realized there was a demand for RISC V, uh, much bigger than what they had thought. So that's when uh, kind of a, a, as the uh, graduate students were graduating, we um, worry what would happen next. Um, so Sci-Fi was born. Uh, so Sci-Fi got to start in 2015. Um, so the founders all came from Berkeley. Uh, the team is also composed of the original a set of research uh, students who worked on these chips while at Berkeley. Um, and since then, uh, Sci-Fi was really focused on commercializing uh, effectively custom RISC-V cores as well as custom chips. So we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, so, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it's like to start a company, like really start a company, what that feels like. Um, and then I'll end with a little bit of what we're actually doing um, as, as a company now uh, making it in the world. So uh, on the upper left, you'll see there, uh, when you actually start a company, like you know, people may work a startup, but if you're actually starting a company and you actually get an office, the first thing you'll realize when you show up is that nothing is there. Uh, it's actually just a room. You actually have to get tables and chairs, uh, get a refrigerator, get a trash can, get make very important decisions like how often should the janitor come? Once a week? Twice a week? Um, things like that. So that's kind of the picture of when we just, just started. I think I was taking the picture. Um, on the right, then you need to get a server. Um, well, these days maybe you don't, you can just run it all on the cloud. But we started off with our own server for uh, uh, moving it into the cloud. So you see that in the upper right. Um, and then that's kind of the office kind of more filled out, uh, if you will, you have tenants. So I'm the one with the grab posture uh, slouching there on the bottom left. Um, so uh, what do we do? We are a chip company at Heart. We help people get risk by stuff, and we also build our own chips. So the very first chip uh, that we built, of course, as a startup, you're on a very, very compressed schedule. You're trying to hit some de some deadline. You're trying to show it off uh, at an event. Um, you barely get the tape out, out, and then you realize, okay, in order to expedite this process, uh, we're going to go hand carry uh, the parts back from TSFC. Um, so this is not a very well documented process. Uh, it's actually very difficult. You need to talk to a lot of people. Uh, we were in Taiwan, that's, that's Yan Sup, he's one of the, the co-founders of, of Sci-Fi, and I, I took the picture, so Yan Sup and I uh, had a very nice walking tour of the TSMC campus, which is very, very large, um, trying to find the right building where we can actually go pick up a uh, box of wafers. Uh, well, we thought it was just small wafers, it's a giant box, now you have a problem. How do you actually bring this box home? Uh, because you've flown all this way, you paid all this money, you're not going to check it in. Um, what are you going to do? Uh, the solution was, oh, you're going to buy a seat. <laughs> on the airplane for your weight. So that's, that's, that's the seat on the airplane um, so that we can bring it back. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of the fun part, I guess, of being in a startup. You get to do some crazy things like this. I think from the date that this picture was taken, which is the day we were in Taiwan getting the wafers, to sawing it, packaging it, putting it on a board, putting software on the board, and showing everybody this board was two weeks. Wow. Okay, so that was pretty incredible. Like, everything kind of really had to work and we were counting uh, literally hours. Like we need to drop this off by 8 a.m. so that we can get back at 5 p.m., um, everything from the bottom. But you get to do things like that uh, when you're in a startup. 
Ah, so how long we're tape out, that's one of the things that we're working on in Site 5 to greatly reduce how long it takes to tape something out. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, uh, side story, then when the unsub landed, uh, you actually had to, didn't fill out the form properly, which means now you're stuck in customs. Uh, we actually were stuck in customs for about 12 hours until we could figure it out because we did not have experience actually filling out the paperwork correctly. Lessons learned. Um, so, company now, um, in about three years later, uh, we have almost 300 employees in 10 offices. Um, required some things along the way. Um, you know, with world-class expertise, so you can kind of see uh, where it all started. So from that original office, which is actually in San Francisco. So not only were we a very, very rare semiconductor startup, we were a semiconductor startup in San Francisco. Okay, so as when I was there, I, I was uh, jokingly called VP of everything else um, because I was the, the non-engineer or the retired engineer. Um, so I really did not appreciate that because all the customers, all the partners, everybody else was still here in the South Bay, as was my home. Um, but anyway, um, we've now moved to uh, the peninsula. San Mateo is our headquarters. Uh, and you kind of see a very uh, global presence. Um, so as you grow at 300, you also end up with an exec team that is larger than the original picture. So what happens. So, um, so what are we really doing? Um, so we talked about risk 5 So Sci-5 as a company, we really do uh, a couple of things. So first, is we help chip companies get access to risk 5 IP, so custom risk 5 IP. Uh, the second part, and I argue the more exciting part, is we want to make building chips much easier, much faster, and much lower cost. And one of the things here, I mean, today we're talking a lot about uh, kind of starting companies and startups, and I can tell you it's the ratio of software companies to hardware companies started, it's really hard to start a hardware company. It's even harder to start a semiconductor company. Now, it's a little better in the last year or so if you have an AI uh, in, your, in your name or something like that. Um, but one of the primary reasons is, you know, to start a software company, you can fund two guys in a garage, you can give them $100,000, they can come back with a working prototype, things are good. And start a soft hardware company, start a semiconductor company, how much does it cost to get to that first chip? Right, so now the VC is looking at it, oh, I have to invest $5 million, $10 million, and I'm going to wait a year to get a chip, and then I'll know if this whole thing works. Whereas I can take the same $5 to $10 million and invest that in 20 different software companies. Right, it's just much easier for that to happen. So we're trying to change all of that. So we think there's a couple of trends uh, that are driving uh, the demand and the need for such a solution. So first, on the hardware side, this was kind of in the world we used to live in. Uh, where we had predictable performance analysis, things got faster uh, every generation, um, the cost per computation kept declining, you just kept going to the next node, things became cheaper, things became faster, but more importantly, it was predictable. Um, so because of this, there was very low, very little incentive to build any custom hardware, because by the time you finish building custom hardware, you just go to the next gen of whatever standard thing there was, and it would just be faster, cheaper, lower power. Um, this is really, kind of no longer the case. Um, I, I will stand by the fact that I think Moore's Law is at the least economically dead. Things are no longer cheaper. You don't get free much. Um, however, uh, we look at where compute is going. Um, we're talking about going over the edge. Um, here, this is the increase in performance uh, relative to the VAX um, over the past 30 years or so of computer architecture. Um, in the beginning, um, we had CIS constructions, and then we had RISC-style architectures, and then we went to multi-core, and then we had other accelerated tax improvements. And really what we're seeing right now um, is really only 3% year-over-year improvement in performance. So this is why there's a need for more custom compute. This is why whenever we talk about AI and machine learning and accelerators, why people are using GPUs, why people are using FPGAs, why people are using TPUs, what have you. It's all about how do you accelerate compute you have to put in hardware. So this is driving a need for custom silicon solutions. So this is running to counter to the whole first problem that I said where it's getting more and more expensive and harder and harder to build chips. At the same time, we have this ever-increasing demand for custom silicon. Like, how do we solve these two, two things? All right, so, so we say we have more custom compute, which means we need more custom hardware because all these applications are different. How do we solve this problem? So the challenge with this right now is as we go to all of these new nodes, the cost has gone exponentially 
higher. Uh, not just the cost, right? The cost is one factor um, in terms of the amount of dollars needed for IP, for tools, for uh, mass tests, for all those things. But that's just one part. An actual other part that's even a bigger problem is the number of people you need. The amount of expertise you need to build a chip. Right? This is just a, a small set. You need an architect, you need logic, you need a RTL front end designer, you need verification, you need layout, you need face and route. And we're not even talking like on the business side. You need to have somebody who knows how to call somebody a kiss and see so they can accept you as a customer. Somebody who knows the package guys. Somebody who can negotiate the EDA contract. The amount of people you need to start a hardware company is ridiculous. And it's preventing innovation. All right? You compare this to software. Instagram was a $1 billion acquisition with 13 employees. So, you know, we should be like, as hardware guys, like we're all kind of hardware scene, like this should really upset us. Right? Like we're like, hey, hardware is really hard. We're working really hard, and it's like 13 people create a billion dollar company, whereas 13 people, on the previous list, I already did 14. <laughs> yeah, right? So, how do they do that? And, and the answer is, in software land, what they discovered is they built a stack. They built an entire technology stack. So a product like Instagram, a company like Instagram, only needs to build the very top part of their product, and they can leverage everything else underneath. And most often, a lot of these are like open source technology stacks. All right? So we need to build the same for hardware. So using RISC-V as kind of an, an anchor, as kind of a, a, a lighthouse that's drawing people in, what Sci-Fi is building, we're building what we think is the world's first hardware technology stack. It's going to let people build chips much faster, much cheaper, much easier. All right? Called Sci-Fi Clusters. So, really, all we're doing is learning from software. So rather than me, I said this, like, let's take what they've done and see if we can apply it to hardware. So a long time ago in software land, what they learned over here on the site um, is that they no longer write their code in assembly. They don't write their code in binary, right? They use higher level programming languages and then they build higher level programming languages on top of that. So the two kids in the garage can build a billion dollar app called Instagram because all they have to do is build the app. We don't ask them to rebuild the operating system or the phone or the compiler or everything else. But in hardware land, we still do the same thing. We write in Verilog, which is basically assembly, right? And we, we then, after we finish building our chip, we go in and we'll modify transistors individually, like at the GDS2 level, because this crosstalk is too high. Or this is, we're, we're, that's basically the equivalent of going in and twiddling with the binary in software land. So how productive can you be? Why do we need so many people? Why is it so long? Well, it's because we're still working at these lower levels. So what we have to do is raise the level of engineering focus. So one of the, the really key things that came out of the group at Berkeley uh, the team that meant RISC-V was not just RISC-V, um, but entire design methodology. So what they've done, so for example, what we do at, at Sci-Fi is we don't write in Verilog, we write in a language called Chisel, which is embedded in Scala, a higher level language, um, which then creates Verilog. This allows us to be much more productive. So the teams now, for example, we have a, a, a huge variety of uh, RISC-V IP cores. Okay, so we have cores that cover uh, if you guys remember with ARM roadmap, there are microcontroller cores like the Cortex M, M0, M3, M7, there are Cortex R, which are real time cores, there are Cortex A, all their multi cores. You know, right now, today, we probably have around, I would say, 70% uh, of their portfolio already covered. All right. Our entire code base, relatively, if you measure it in, in Chisel, is something around 10 to 15,000 lines of code in Chisel. A single Cortex A9, which is one core from ARM, it's a million lines of Verilog. Right, so how much more productive can a programmer be if you have 10,000 lines of code versus a million? That's just one core, not 70% of their cores. Now, of course, when you can take Chisel and you turn it into Verilog, it expands out to be much bigger. But that's the same thing as when we look at Java, higher level one, which is versus assembly. So we have to raise the level of abstraction. So what I talked about earlier, um, when I said read, what we look for is software to write hardware. That's what we're working on. And then what we're building is this entire uh, vertical stack, this hardware stack um, that will let folks build chips on their own. So companies can come in with just their IP. Right? You have some unique IP that's going to accelerate 
the latest, greatest AI algorithm, whatever you want. Well, you know what? You want to put that in silicon? The rest of that chip, 90% of that chip, is, is really a commodity to you. You need GDR, you need a CPU, you need PCIe, you need, you know, whatever. You need UART, you need i 2 Those are all normal stuff. But in hardware, we make you rebuild it. We make you reacquire it, rebuild it, relay it out, you have to do it all by yourself. So, what we're doing at Sci-5 is an entire design layer uh, where customers can come in, they can bring in their own IP. We have Sci-5 IP, which comes from the RISC-V cores. We have partners, uh, IP partners, we call design chair partners, that you have access to their IP. We assemble it, uh, we run that on our systems. So we have our servers, our tools, so you don't need to have your own tools, you don't need to have your own cloud, you don't need to have your own servers. Um, and you do all this stuff, and then you can get chips. And the whole point of all of this is we're really focused on reducing the cost to prototype. Not the final cost of production, although that, that helps, but the cost to prototype. Right now in hardware, the cost to get that first chip is just as expensive as the cost to get like many chips. Right, so in prototyping phase, we're looking at you know, the IB partners, ourselves, everybody kicking in. How do we lower that cost so that more companies can get started to build chips so that they can start their company? knowing very well that most of those guys are probably never going to reach production. But that's okay. Because we can create 10 new companies who can try and build prototypes. Even if 90% of them fail, we have another new company coming in. Right? So some of these platforms, like we're talking about, we have a microcontroller platform. Today, if you want to get prototypes, you need like 100 chips. That's kind of roughly how we define prototypes. You get 100 chips. Right? These are full-on ASICs. We value them out. We do everything. We have $100,000 for 100 chips. Okay, $100,000 is still $100,000, but compared to how much it costs to actually build a chip, it's dramatically low. Okay. So, uh, this is an early version. Uh, you'll see a much better version of this web interface shortly. Uh, but this is the product. Companies come here, you see a product like this, um, and then you go in there and you can customize your own cores or your own chip. So as simple as clicking some buttons and removing some things, that's how we d deliver our course today. Um, of course, we have a couple of different uh, templates and starting points, but you go in, uh, you're changing a few things, and then we're recreating uh, the actual design, uh, the verification, the testing, the running, everything uh, on the hardware side. Uh, that's really what we're working on. Um, so customers use it, they can get this 5 IP, or they can use the other version, and they can get actual chips uh, delivered to them. So uh, at the end of the day, um, Proof is in the pudding. So this is an actual chip that we built using all this automated stuff that I talked about that sounds really good and maybe you don't believe it actually works or whatever. Uh, this is a 28 nanometer chip that we built using our own methodology. It has five cores, including our U54, which is our Linux capable. So it's a Linux capable multi-core uh, running at 1.5 gigahertz in 20 nanometers. So this is a, you know, I'd argue, highly full-fledged performing chip, very competitive in the market. Uh, which means that you can use automation, you can use design techniques to still build chips um, that are, that are world-class. This is available, you can buy it, people test it out for themselves. This is the only Linux-capable uh, RISC-V chip currently uh, on the market, so a lot of the software that's being ported for RISC-V is actually imported uh, right against this chip. Similarly, we have one uh, for microcontroller, for RTOS, and other things are being imported uh, for that. So, uh, with that, the last slide, the big benefit here, um, is reducing the prototyping cost means we'll have more design starts. Uh, we'll have a brand new ecosystem where more people can provide IP. IP providers have a way that they can sell their IP because now they can be part of this platform. Um, you can have more customization. Everybody can still get their custom chip, focus on what they do best for their differentiation, which means we can have more startups. Uh, and each startup doesn't need to have 14 guys. It can be two guys, reduce the level of excitement. And most importantly, as an industry, as a hardware industry, um, we need to increase the level of excitement. Okay, like I, you know, no offense to everybody else, is when I, if you go to a software conference, I'm like old. Okay, it's like young people, people energetic, want to try new stuff. When you hardware things, I'm like young. That's seriously, right? Because you need people much younger than I who are interested in wanting to do hardware or this industry will not keep going. Right, so we have to bring some by back. We have to make it easier for them to start companies. We have to make it easier for them. We have to encourage them to build more things. And that's really what we're working on. Thank you. Currently seeking startups to focus on China and U.S. markets from Skytree Ventures. Joseph has mentored over 100 startups, 
both in hardware from Y Combinator, 500 Startups, Labs360, and Alchemist Accelerator. Joseph is the co-founder of Labs360 Hardware Incubator, and uh, previously Joseph consulted with Intellectual Venture on IP portfolio strategy. Um, so Joseph, would you like to uh, take over the panel? Yeah. All right. Is that? Okay. Um, maybe we'll take a quick question. How, how many people are in startups in the audience? Not that many. And the rest of the people are with the companies? Okay. All right. Any uh, investors in the, uh, in the audience? Everybody's going to come to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we'll have a very interesting panel tonight. I mean, um, Two from the investor side, and two from the uh, the staff side. So maybe I start out with uh, Brian. I mean, um, so we met a couple of times already. Um, how did you come about? I mean, did you just want to do a startup, or did you just just kind of want to play with people? that is going to be solved. 
and I think that is, um, it helps people to see which, which sectors, which area, which problem, uh, you know, is being solved and what is the scope of that problem. And from an investor standpoint, it's, it's important to understand how big is the size of the market and, and how, what's the gravity of the problem being solved as well. Now, um, that said, it's, uh, software is the rails, but really you need the hardware to, to be able to in, you know, make it a complete engine for innovation. So I think uh, hardware is an, in, in, is an imperative ingredient but uh, entrepreneurs should think on what problem they're trying to solve as opposed to just building a hardware company. Yeah, I mean, if anyone knows about software, they could not run on hardware, you know, <laughs> all ears. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a good point, yes. And a big part of that is, uh, you know, is the full solution. I mean, it, it, especially when you're talking about high performance software, IP, um, you need to be that close to the hardware to, to be able to see what's been brought, what's come before, you know, not just adding a little layer on top of everything. So we have a question from the audience. Yeah, so um, Dr. Patterson, since we're talking about SI5, right, um, has said in the past that he believes good design can, can make an order of magnitude difference in terms of hardware performance or power consumption, depending on how you do. <laughs> yeah, of course. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Patterson, uh, who is a retired professor from UC Berkeley and was, you know, SI5s, he said that in several, several public forums that he thinks good design can make an order of magnitude difference, either in terms of power consumption or performance. Uh, does the panel still generally agree with that, or have they run into design roadblocks? Um, allow me that. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely agree, but I think where where people get this wrong is like nowadays good design has to blend both the software with the hardware. Like you have to be designing at a system level, and I think that's why uh, there's this need for when I say custom hardware, we're talking about actually custom silicon, but it, it's to serve a specific purpose. So if you're designing your software with your hardware together in mind, you can get great efficiency. Because if you customize specific algorithms, specific things, you can easily get 10x, 20x type performance or power improvements. But if you're just designing one side in the vacuum from the other, then, then you are going to run into those roadblocks. There's no more free lunch. Well, since you volunteered, <laughs> um, what, what, are, what problems are you avoiding that Tensilica and ARC didn't avoid? So, this is a great question. So, this is really one of uh, customization versus fragmentation. Um, and the real benefit of RISC V is that everybody gets to share in this very common software ecosystem. So we look at uh, the software ecosystem, and this is really what ARM did really well, and all credit to them why they're so successful is because they had a giant software ecosystem that all runs on ARM. Um, and what we have here now with RISC V is it's a common RIS instruction set, a common session set uh, architecture that all software can be targeted towards. So here, uh, the RISC V designers did a really good job of making it a modular instruction set. Um, so the base level instructions are constant, and then there's standard extensions. Um, and then if you want to add in your own uh, custom extensions, uh, there's a place for that reserved in a place that will never run over uh, any of the standard extensions. So this means that all the standard extensions, all the standard software, all the standard tools, uh, all your debug tools, your Linux ports, your Debian, your Fedora, uh, Ubuntu, your RTOS program, all your products, all of these things can all be targeting the same common infrastructure. Um, so that's where you get the benefit of the scale. Um, and then you're adding in your secret sauce on top. Uh, so I think that's the, the kind of the biggest difference where uh, if I look at something like, like Tensilica, is like you, you get it baked in and then you're running the, the Tensilica compiler, Tensilica tool chain. Here you still get the entire suite of tools from open source tools to third party commercial tools and then they're for RISC-5. Uh, they're not for like sci-fi, they're not for like you, they're not for just this one project. So you continue to get the benefits of GCC improvements, LLVM improvements. Um, these things are, these open source projects are continually being uh, maintained and uh, improved uh, because it's mainline, you continue to ride that benefit. 
So I think that's where you get the benefit of the ecosystem, but still have the ability uh, to differentiate your, your, your own product. Anything you want to add to it? Sure. So uh, I totally agree with what you're saying, and also uh, what, I, uh, what you mentioned early on uh, in terms of lowering the cost uh, for the company in, in the hardware company, uh, new chip uh, company, because we do see uh, a changing uh, theme of uh, new startups that they, you know, uh, one of the components that they, they're based on the core are um, based on the open source. Uh, uh, risk five core, and then add to their secret sauce in you know, and try to develop chips in a different variety of applications. So we do see uh, more and more companies, uh, you know, is developing uh, stars and new chips based on the risk five. So basically, you answered that question. So we had actually Dave, Dave Patterson at SSCS in March. He basically, I mean, the focus for those talks is mainly on technology. But the, as you said, the ecosystem building and adoption is the main thing, right? And ARM already has that. So what's your strategy to uh, really build that? I mean, you, you touched on that in, in, in what you just mentioned. But like, uh, it probably you need a lot of like marketing and. Uh, advertisement to get more developer in and Linux and you know operating system level uh, to, to to the level that uh, to get to the level that the arm is already uh, has that uh, basically uh, base in the market. Yeah, right. What's your strategy for that? Yeah, so uh, this is a great question that actually kind of ties into to when Sci-Fi was started three years ago, and you know I, I decided to join uh, very early on, and at that point, you know that was it was a big risk. It's like you know. Will RISC V be a thing? Like you, like you said, like you, you have to have this ecosystem. You need all this software. You need all this stuff. And I can tell you one thing: is like, there's no way this would have happened if it was just sci-fi. Um, what really drove this uh, was this is the open source community, uh, open source hardware, open source software uh, coming together. Um, everybody realizing that it's in everybody's benefit. So if we look at the RISC V Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit foundation of <coughs> member companies, to um, it's basically like Standards body for for risk five of marketing is made up of over you know, hundred different member companies, some of the largest companies in the world, including you know, Nvidia, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Qualcomm, NXP, uh, Western Digital. So all these large companies are all part of the risk five foundation, and everybody sees that they can all contribute in areas they know, contribute to the open source things, uh, participate in these task groups, um, and they all derive the benefit of having that being common. Uh, and they can build things on top. So, you know, I think it's a it's a huge variety of factors in terms of timing in the marketplace. You know, ARM got bought by SoftBank. ARM, you know, has not been treating their customers the most friendliest environment and creating an environment. A lot of things had to happen, right? I, there's no magic formula for creating a new <laughs> ISA. A new ISA only shows up once every 30 years. So this is a really, really rare opportunity. We have x86, we have ARM, and now we really have like Risk five, and I think at this point, three years or actually you know eight years into the journey, um, Risk five has definitely reached the point where it's definitely going to be a thing with or without Sci five. Like Risk five has firmly established itself. Um, the only question now is how quickly uh, will it continue to grow, and which market will it grow in? So this is why uh, all these new markets are very exciting um, because it's not just about the mobile phones, if you will, right? It's all these new areas uh, that require new innovation that don't have huge amounts of built-in software, and they don't have like lots of software binaries of their stuff that they have to run. These are all right opportunities for RISC-V, because RISC-V is about uh, then letting companies bring in new innovations, they can do new things, you can have your own core, you don't have to pick one of eight you know, options, and if you will, like you only have this one or this one, um, you can add your own thing. So, you know, I see a lot of the new markets now adopting it. Um, certainly, it still has quite a way to go to reach the, the ARM level, ARM as a finish How much you, can you give a number like how much you guys are for ARM? So, so I mean, I, that's like a, uh, there's multiple companies uh, who all provide this five cores, um, as well as companies can always build their own. Um, so uh, the the ability to kind of monopoly price goes away. Um, so this means there's new business models have to be created. It's not going to be the same old business model uh, of like license and royalty and what it was. 
Um, so we, it, it, it's, it's not an apples and apples comparison because the models have to completely change. And so we're talking about how do we enable our customers to customize their own design so they can change uh, all the microarchitecture, so they can change certain things so they can get different types of cores. So it's a completely uh, different way of looking at it. And then companies also look at it as like, now if I choose to join, if I choose to change my product in RISC-V, if I use RISC-V, you're making a decision to join the RISC-V ecosystem. You're not making a decision to work with sci-fi. Right? You're, you're in the ecosystem. Now maybe first round you use sci-fi, maybe second round you use sci-fi, but if there's ever a time when you, know, you want something that we don't have, there's other options you can build your own. So this makes a much different dynamic in the, environment, in the ecosystem competitively. Can I find you even so th this is this is really interesting. So if, if you live on the edge, so to speak, or want to live on the edge with a system that maybe integrates some of these technologies, uh, what sort of quantity do you need to have to make this economic? You can, you can say you can buy a hundred chips for a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Clearly, that's not. You know, there are few applications that, that can can uh, stomach such a such a cost of goods. So, do I need to, for my product, uh, in, in order for for your technology to be interesting, do I need to have a demand of? 10,000 systems, or a million systems, or a thousand, or uh, where, where, where does it really make sense to consider to take this road of custom silicon? So, uh, sorry, you guys, this, uh, this question applies to, to everybody, um, but uh, I'll try to run real fast. I think when you look at custom silicon, there's, there's still two parts to the cost. There's the upfront cost, and then there's the per unit cost. And my, my comment about the prototyping was the upfront cost to prototype is extraordinarily high. So we don't even get to see a whole bunch of new designs or new types of chips uh, that can be built. So that 100, 800 parts, that's to get the prototyping phase um, to prove out the market. So you can have a working sample, go to the investors, uh, raise money, create a company, prove out to your customers, uh, get an order. Um, but then you still have to convert that to production. There's still material costs mass cost, things like that. So that depends on your technology node uh, and other things. I do think the industry as a whole has been geared towards building like a lot of like one thing. And we're not really geared to build lots of different things. So this is gonna be an industry-wide effort. I think we're trying to take on from the IP standpoint, from the design standpoint. Uh, we have partners, we still need to work with things. Uh, I think there's still a lot of innovation left for, for tools and for foundries and for other folks. To, to look at different models for people who are not in, in the field one thing many, many different times. So, okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, I'll just add on to that. that uh, I mean, as with anything, it, it really depends. Uh, so, obviously, I'll say about as vague an answer as you can get, but it's it, not only do you have to take into consideration the, uh, the upfront cost of taking everything out and the per unit cost of manufacturing going forward. There's massive costs in just delaying your time to market. Um, I mean, if you're taping out something that you can buy off the shelf in you know three minutes versus you know waiting six months to get custom silicon in, in the house or you know, whatever your guys' timeline is, but you know there's also expertise that you have to consider, um, and that applies to no matter which solution you're going with. Um, for us, you know, we, we do ARM and PGA SOC stuff, so. We're piggybacking on the ARM ecosystem. You know that's kind of the the, the nice part of it. But of course, the whole rub with FPGA is they're hard, not you know every Tom, Nick, and Harry can't program the things. They're they're relatively complicated. I mean, not as complicated as laying a custom silicon, which you know is being worked on. Uh, but you know that is another consideration. But you know if the, the, it's also instantaneous. I mean when you push your RTL, you know, to the gates, like, you're, you're done, there's your ship. So, I mean, yes, you're, you're probably going to pay more for it than you would just stick it in a bunch of, you know, $2 microcontrollers all over the place. Um, but then if you consider performance, how critical is it that you need to harden the different IP that you're producing? Uh, I mean, there's just so many different layers. It's a very complicated, obviously, equation to figure out. 
Um, but it becomes easier once the, the cost to implement these things, whether that's, you know, we were talking about layers of abstraction before, whether that's all the way to the silicon level, or even that matter, like FPGA IP implementation, um, there's some like interesting software tools out there that Intel and Xilinx are always, you know, duking it out on. Um, but, you know, and, and it's, you know, and then you compare that with things like, uh, like what, what NVIDIA is doing. Um, you know, they've definitely won the software battle from that standpoint, uh, and that's why they're the AI kings basically right now. Um, but with that, you know, with the particular architecture they're doing, there's no way in get, getting around the, the power costs of, and, and, and size and weight constraints and all that kind of stuff when you're sticking, you know, GPUs on things that are taking up tens of watts, you know, that you can do in a fraction of a watt like an FPGA or custom silicon. So, there's, there's so many different factors, you know, when it comes to the actual, not only production costs, you know, commercialization, the time to market, the operation costs, all these different things. It's not, it's definitely not like a, <laughs> oh, I know, I'm sure you're looking for like a, a you know, 100,000 units, that's the cutoff, you know, obviously you're never going to get that, but a lot of things, things you consider anyway. More comments. So I think from an investor point of view, it really lowers the barrier not only in time, but also you know in terms of uh, you know, the size of team that required to deliver a new design uh, for uh, some innovation that we have not seen before. So uh, it also helps us to kind of uh, be more comfortable to play, you know, to invest in a company that we know, you know, it will take them uh, less amount of time and uh, less amount of money to uh, enable the company to deliver some product and then test the market. So it's an attempt to, I think, uh, democratize design and it's more of a tool for innovation as opposed to creating a complete platform with everything uh, thought through on, on how to scale. It is what's possible with the tool, not, not really in terms of, you know, uh, not thinking in terms of a particular vertical and then scaling it out. So I agree with uh, Josh that from an investor standpoint, it is um, it is a whole suite of tools opening up to what's possible in design. My question is for Ryan. Uh, so how do you compare your FPGA based solutions to that of uh, GPU based solutions uh, like Jetson and Gates to board, uh, which has very less design cycle time? But uh, are recently being used for more computer vision or robotics applications. How do you compare in terms of power and design cycle time? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's so performance is kind of tricky. Just it, it's just really hard to get like an apples to apples comparison. Um, if you're just talking about raw compute power, uh, what's not as difficult or not as ambiguous is the compute per watt, uh, like I was mentioning before. So, I mean, you're talking, you know, at least an order of magnitude or more, for the most part, uh, when you're comparing, you know, uh, basically the number of computations you're doing per second or whatever your metric you're using um, per watt of consumed energy. So that's, in addition, as like an extension of that, I mean, if you're talking about using those in embedded applications, um, there are other considerations if, if they're say, a mobile application or a small application if you're doing like this miniature robotic robot or drone or even something that's kind of a tightly integrated piece of industrial equipment, um, cooling when it, when it starts to become a factor. Um, so do you need to stick a gigantic fan on top of your GPU to keep it cool? Um, do you, are you using convection radiation? You know, are you, you know, how are you heat sinking that? It's, you know, getting off, getting that heat off. That's going to be a hard limit based uh, uh, on the amount of computation you can do. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's other factors, of course, costs, and like you said, I mean, one of the trade-offs is, um, you know, from a software perspective, you know, they have all these different paradigms and you know, great tools and support and all that. You know, pretty big ecosystem at this point. Uh, to support the GPU side of things, um, just because it's been used for so much other stuff for all these years. Uh, but I mean, I think uh, you know one one final piece that's always tricky with with GPUs is is integration in like mechatronic systems um, and, and industrial automation and things like that. 
um, being having the I/O flexibility to be able to incorporate you know multiple different uh, interfaces, communication buses, you know motors, sensors, actuators, uh, you know networking interfaces, all these different types of things. Um, that's a huge, a huge barrier to get over if you're talking about implementing a commercial system like that. Because um, what you run into a lot of times is you get two thirds of the way through the project and a requirement will change, or you'll realize that actually this interface you thought you know that only required you know ten of a certain type of uh, a certain number of pins, or actually requires twenty. You know, if you go back to you know your your selection of like five thousand microcontrollers that you picked through the first time you were going through. Um, and select a different one and now start, you know, not necessarily start from scratch, but reconfigure things or maybe you got to add a new processor on there, which means you got another software layer, you know, communication layer to deal with. So having that I/O flexibility and the performance flexibility um, while also piggybacking on existing uh, architectures and tools is kind of what we find the sweet spot to be. Um, and there's obviously plenty of applications that, that GPUs are, are good for. Um, but even when you're talking about you know autonomous vehicles and computer vision and things like that, where you're you're in taking a lot of different different data from different sources, different types of data, um, you want to be able to process that in a parallel fashion in an extremely energy efficient way. Um, FPGAs, aside from the, the difficulty of programming them, are just going to blow away a, a GPU um, for for any types of applications like that. Um, so. <coughs> Can you share what it was like when you first got your first customers to use your products? Um, yeah, so we actually we launched our, our product uh, on a, via a crowdfunding campaign. Um, so we got kind of all of our first customers all at once, um, which sounds great, uh, but in reality it's a total nightmare. Um, it's, I mean, you know, we wouldn't be here today, obviously, if it wasn't for, for the crowdfunding campaign. We would have launched in a different way, probably, and, you know, whatever. Things would have worked out differently. But um, there, when you publicly expose yourself like that, uh, you're taking on a lot of burden, I guess I would say, um, when it comes to, you know, we're still working on delivering one of the products we originally promised, like, on the manufacturing line right now, a few miles from here actually, uh, we're working on delivering like three years after the fact. And you can imagine three years of 3,000 people asking you what the hell's the matter with you, what's, you know, what's taking so long, are you guys stupid, like, you know, what, give me my money back, is this a scam? It's like every possible thing you've ever even, you can think of, and even a lot of you can't. Um, it's really draining. Uh, on the flip side of that, we've had some positive but some negative experiences with commercial customers as well. So our, our hardware business model is really based around, we want to sell you a thing, a snickerdoodle, but what we want you to do with it is now take that snickerdoodle, put it into a product that you're making, and buy a thousand a month from us, um, or more, or whatever. Um, so, so that that part was helped by the crowdfunding campaign because it got us exposure and you know a lot of media coverage and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you ever want to start a consulting business, just launch a crowdfunding campaign. Um, you get a lot of opportunities you would never otherwise come across. Again, for better or for worse. Um, one of the tricky parts about that though is, in our case, like I was mentioning before, we do like engineering services to kind of help facilitate that process of integrating these systems and getting our product in there. Uh, it's the, the the dream of kind of the, the whole like I'm going to work on my own at a consulting gig and you know I'll have all this extra time and money because I'm setting my own schedule and you know that I can catapult off of that and it'll be you know right that to glory is like a total pipe dream. Um, it's it's we did it like the other way around, which is already even worse because then we started like right out of the gate with how much money and technical and financial debt to get this product uh, off the line. Um, and also keep the lights on, you know, not starve and, you know, not have all these people, you know, burning down our building or whatever. So, you know, the, uh, anyway, I'll be kind of speed this up a little bit, but, well, like, lesson learned, like, we actually worked with the company for uh, a year and a half, two years on getting their product to market. 
um, where there were a ton of our own time and capital and all the rest of it, uh, and they were paying, you know, it's not like we're not working for free, but um, what ended up happening is we got them in the market, we got them just like started their production runs, and then they canned the whole project and said, you know, we're going to work on something else, this didn't work out, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so we took a, take on a lot of risk for, you know, a reward that might not ever come. And now you just set yourself back another couple of years and whatever other opportunities that might come along the way. So it's, it's very, you got to be really picky with, with the opportunities that come up. Um, you don't want to just do, you know, say yes to everything uh, because you'll just, you're bound to get burned, you're bound to do that. And, um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of different like, lessons to take away from all of it, but I don't know if that answered your question or, or just scares you away enough to not ask you something more. But uh, yeah, that's sort, of, that's sort of part of our experience. Not it's not all like you know rosy and you know like not a great uh, thing, but you know if you learn from it, move on, and then hopefully hopefully something good comes of it in the end. You know? So um, fortunately, things come out from nine o'clock. Like, play out the little first. So maybe uh, one minute closing statement from each of the panelists. Um, and what do you see in terms of injury, in terms of how that innovation? Uh, sure, that's a good point. Uh, I, I think we're uh, startups or entrepreneurs here. Uh, it's uh, it's relatively easy to create uh, innovation or, or uh, a new technology, but it's uh, it's really hard to uh, build a business or a company. Right? So that that along that that journey, you, you need a lot of help from the team, from the capital point of view, from you know uh, uh, your your personal investment. So. Uh, you know, looking forward to uh, share more with you guys after after this event, uh, and you know, uh, feel free to pay me afterwards. Thanks. Um, yeah, I kind of talked about the company. I think just you know, if you if you have an idea that, that you really believe in, you should you should go for it. And um, you know, it's not all in your control. Um, a lot of things are you know you need things to fall in place, and but you have to be there when it does. So you take advantage of it. Um, and then when you see it, then run as fast as you can. I think it's a great time for hardware innovation because there are a tremendous amount of applications that are requiring that kind, driving that kind of innovation. And there's, an, there's basically a new white space created um, with different uh, applications of software that are creating the rails for the hardware to come in and be a complete solution solving a problem. So I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity now that has opened up through AI, through particularly through autonomous driving um, and um, urban mobility as, as a sector and also blockchain. Uh, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, it's like not, I mean, I can't even, do you have any idea what my night looks like? I'm going to get on Caltrain at about you know, 10 o'clock and then I have an hour long phone call on the test bench uh, for a new piece of production hardware that if it doesn't work, we're completely screwed um, and we're going to be out of money in like two weeks. So, uh, I mean, uh, it, like, and I'm not joking. So, uh, it is funny though. So, it, uh, it is it's by far the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say I wouldn't recommend it uh, because it can be very rewarding and we'll see what happens. Um, but. You know that uh, sometimes the uh, the three people in a room, uh, you know, three years ago, uh, doesn't turn into a 300 person company. Sometimes it stays three people in a room, and uh, you're still stuck with manufacturing and supply chain and financial and, and engineering and you know sales and d distribution and every possible problem you can ever think of. Um, so you know it's it's a uh, not for the faint of heart, I guess, but uh, but it's you know. I would not want to start a software company. So, you know, I mean, you can take everything of what it is. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's awesome and it's super exciting. There's nothing like the feeling of getting uh, a new piece of hardware. We might experience it tomorrow about 1 p.m. A uh, new piece of hardware and you open it up, it's like a, you know, it's like a kid on Christmas. Um, you just bust open the box and it's so exciting uh, to get this piece of hardware that you know you've like, this, you're, you pour your heart and soul into it um, and you just pray it turns off when you plug it in. But, uh, all right, so uh, I'll just close with um, uh, last week we had the uh, uh, celebration of Moore's Law in Armstrong. They had to be there at the Computer History Museum, and I'm going to quote the uh, chairman from the Computer History Museum that they had already said uh, that every piece of software had to run on something. So until the box software was around software, we still had to have uh, now. We still have to have the data house. So, uh, thank you very much for all this. Thank you very much.
Can anybody last copy? <laughs> Will the slides be 